Welcome to Healthcare Disrupted, where conversations, topics, and innovators share how they are disrupting healthcare to change a cookie cutter healthcare system to become more innovative, creative, and result driven. Now, here are your hosts, Renee Lumain and Jasmine Vilas. Okay, so COVID, COVID, yes. COVID, everything COVID these days, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I would like to start off you know, by saying it truly has amazed me to, uh, to see how things have changed, how people are responding to this, you know, COVID situation. And, uh, you know, I would like to kind of jump into it. Where I am today, I'm here in New York City. Who would have Round ever zero. imagined? <laughs> <laughs> and and you know first and foremost i just want to thank all the first responders you know physicians nurses all the military members who truly have come together and you know fight this in, invisible adversary in the united states mm -hmm. um you know being in ground zero in new york city where COVID has you know impacted the this economy uh, the people in this city Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, everybody coming together are really working hard. Uh, they're working long hours to to take care of patients that are truly being being affected by this. You know, I remember three years ago when I came to New York, it was such a lively city. People were out and about. Um, I, yeah, mean, nice I mean, I mean, you see exactly right. <laughs> I mean, people were just moving around. I mean, you see the economy, it was live and well, but now mm -hmm. New York is almost like a ghost town. Um, you know, you, you barely see anybody out. You do mm -hmm. see a lot of homeless people out and about, but most importantly, it's, you know, you know to see how this city has changed and how it has affected it. It's mm -hmm. really sad to see. It is, you know, it's funny at every time that anyone brings that up or brings up those pictures, you know, always takes you back to that I am legend scene, you know, the very first mm -hmm. moment you see that, that's those streets empty when Mil Will Smith walks out there, you're like, oh, <laughs> at least for me, I mean, for me, Times Square, yeah. you know, and New York that I spent my childhood there. So it is near and dear to my heart. So it definitely, it hits home when I see pictures and images. I just, I can't, you know, it's, and so God bless you for being able to go out there and face it. You know, we've been trying to do this for some time. We've been planning and kind of putting things in, in place to get this podcast off the ground. And certainly, you know, when you get that call and you're going out there to ground zero, it was, uh, you know, I'm thinking that, okay, this probably is going to, everything's on hold, right? Like everything in the world would just stop and just wait. Right, <laughs> but I'm right. glad that, that we still are going to do this because I think it's, it's a great time to just kind of have that dialogue and really talk through everything that's going on in the world. And, and this really, this topic is centered around healthcare. Everything COVID is healthcare. So it's, I think at the perfect time for us to just launch right into this conversation. Absolutely. You know, I remember when I first got the call to come out to New York, to be honest with you, I was scared, <laughs> you know, because here I am back home in Texas with my family and, you know, we're quarantining. We're not really going out unless we need to go to the groceries. But, you know, I'm thinking, man, I'm about to go to Ground Zero, a city that has been, you know, extremely impacted by this virus. And I'm thinking, what if I get it? And if I do get it, what if I don't make it through, you know? And so I don't see I have, my home again, right? It's a real, right. it's a real concern. So. Exactly. And so, but then again, too, you know, it's one of those things you have to trust that, you know, being with the military and even civilian contractors and people that are with FEMA and, you know, the public health systems that they are going to, uh, you know, uh, through their expertise and experience and what they know about this virus, that they're going to put us in the best situation to ensure that we are protecting ourselves by, you know, wearing our gowns, um, our gloves, our masks, our, you know, our, our eye goggles, and just making sure that they teach us how often we need to sanitize and even hand wash our hands so while we are here. And so, you know, the training that we have received have, have been exceptional. And, uh, and, and, you know, for me to be a part of the PPE team to constantly instruct clinicians who are going into the patient care area 
on how to properly, you know, put on their gowns or gloves or goggles. And, and, and you know, in, in every step, we're constantly sanitizing their hands, you know, and it may seem a little bit redundant, but, you know, we're always telling them, this is really for your own protection. We don't want to take any chances. So any, so every chance that we get, we're going to sanitize you and make sure that you're properly disinfected. So that way, you know, we make sure that, that, that you get back home to, to family and friends. Mm-hmm. No, I love it. You know, it's interesting that you talk about educating the, <laughs> the, the clinicians, <laughs> right? You're like, well, obviously they know these basic habits, but um, you know, they're, we all get pushed into unfortunate bad habits, right? And sometimes they, they trickle in from childhood or, or yes. uh, other places. And you're, you're like, well, no big deal if I didn't wash for the full two happy birthday songs, right? Like <laughs> your parents would tell you <laughs> or the full alphabet or whatever, whatever your family said you had to do, you know? And so when you start kind of moving into busy life, mm-hmm. you, you're rushing around here and there. And these little steps, they get skipped, you know? My, my life had always been a little bit unique in that way that I, I literally grew up with a pretty germophobic mother. So, <laughs> so my reality was a little different. It was like, did you wash your hands? Did, did you put antibacterial? Did you like, right. <laughs> put it on the extreme on the other side of things? Right. But I think that it's pretty interesting to, to find out that, you know, this yeah. kind of awareness that there's this gap or has been this gap in basic mm-hmm cleanliness habits and you know just just for your own even if you Mm -hmm. aren't necessarily going out and and caring for patients at that moment just to know Mm -hmm. that whenever you're going to go into that meeting and you're going to shake a hand and you're not going to bring something that was just in the bathroom with you exactly (laughs) (laughs) this kind of personal feeling whether I'm a provider or not like I'm interacting yeah. with people and I'm not leaving my residue on them. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. Correct. So I, I think it's pretty interesting that, you know, when you, when you are in these environments now, we're, we're all, I think, feeling more awareness mm-hmm. to this need yes. of hygiene, right? Absolutely. So hygiene. And Absolutely. I, at least maybe that'll be one thing that we'll, we'll find, I hope, sticks, right? Like Correct. they're like, oh, you know, don't put your hands in your mouth. Don't do, and you're like, all these things are like, wait a second. This is exactly <laughs> what I tell my five-year-old. Like, <laughs> how did, and now we're telling grownups not to do this, right? Like the right. parents were like, don't put your hands there. Don't do that. Don't touch that. And then put your hands in your mouth. Like, <laughs> and now all of a sudden this is what we're being told as adults. So, so I think that it's really good that, you know, we've, we're, we're having this kind of renewal of, mm-hmm. of habits. Yeah. Um, and so. You know, it's it, kind, of, kind of interesting, but it, but inspiring, I guess, in another way too that this is happening. Correct, it is, and you know, I can really see uh, because of this COVID situation, um, even now, because uh, here in New York, uh, initially, a lot of businesses, stores, uh, a lot of restaurants were shut down, but with the few that were open you do see where they post signs of, hey, you know, uh, uh, we only limit X amount of, you know, people coming into the stores. And they actually place tapes on the ground Mm -hmm. that are literally six feet uh, apart, which is the distance that is recommended. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as, you know, because if somebody sneezes, you need at least six feet to where uh, you won't come in contact with that germ. Um, but also too, you see a lot of sanitizers, you know, around, you know, mm. uh, around different businesses. And so I do hope even after, you know, this whole, like this country get over this, that we will continue to see a lot more sanitizers, um, or, you know, around different places so that people will have that opportunity or even people carrying small bottles of, of, of sanitizers. And, mm-hmm. you know, really going back to your point, uh, for me, uh, you know, I would like to say I've always been, you know, pretty good with making sure I wash my hand after using the bathroom. Um, I know my wife, she does a great job carrying sanitizer uh, with her because whenever we do go to restaurants before we eat, she's like, hey, let me get your hand. And she'll squeeze some sanitizer on our hands, right? right. And so it's just making that conscious effort and being mindful uh, to just make sure it's, you know, about being cleanliness, but also keeping other people in mind as well, too. So Absolutely. Yeah, it's funny. Um, we talk about restaurants and, and when I just being 
being at this stage in life when you're going to these restaurants and, and you're, if you are doing any of the curbside pickups or anything like that, mm -hmm. we have, we have a local restaurant here that, you know, small mom and pop place. They've got two locations here and in a neighboring town. And um, I was impressed. They posted a video, a recorded video that they did that shows every single habit that they're putting in place for COVID protection. Um, mm -hmm. And I, sh I talked to my mom about it and she was like, girl, how I, I didn't know they didn't wear gloves when they were making our food anyway. <laughs> Why are they wearing gloves anyway? But you know, it's funny because yeah, I, I years, a couple of years back, I mean, my son was probably one or two. So maybe three or four years ago, I remember um, waking up at, in the middle of the night and re realizing that something did not settle well in my system and <laughs> finding out that I ended up with the norovirus. Oh, and man. this, the awareness <laughs> that you ended up with the norovirus. And when you look up exactly how you get the norovirus right. and, and it, the words literally say, consumption of fecal matter. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, oh, oh. I was almost, I, I think I went weeks without even the idea <laughs> that I would ever go back to a restaurant again and sit oh down God. because <laughs> just the fact that, that I knew yeah. that I ate someone else's, you know wow. what, <laughs> that completely shocked my world. So um, so wow. my mother's point, you know, it's like all of these habits that they're sharing that they're doing now, mm -hmm. I hope it sticks. You know, my, my husband has been in the restaurant business for many, many years and mm -hmm. he's, he's um, you know, one of those restaurants, safety, health and safety, food safety, uh, license experts or whatever, trainers. So mm -hmm. he has to teach people about these things. And he's like, you'll be amazed at, you know, how, even though we have the signs because they're required to have the signs up about wash your hands, all employees must wash their hands on. You'd be right. amazed with how many people walk out of the bathroom and then don't go straight to the sink because when they get back into the area where they're handling food, they're supposed to wash their hands again. And mm -hmm. they think, oh, but I just did that in the bathroom. Right. But you right. walk out of the bathroom, open the door, walk in the kitchen, open the door, you touch some mm -hmm. other things mm -hmm. and you're about to handle food. So wash your hands, like little reminders. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they have to be, you just keep having to like drill it into them. So I think that you know, all of this kind of real awareness, you know, people are talking about, oh my gosh, it's like airborne, it's spread. I'm like, dude, everything, you cough and you have a cold, <laughs> you're cold, I'm sorry, <laughs> pretty much the same thing. This is all, this is, this is the way that, you know, this uh, aerosol gets sprayed when you're sick. So a lesson mm -hmm. to be learned from everybody, if you've got the flu, if you've got a bug yeah. that you think could be transmitted, let's maybe protect yourself. Stay Correct. Home. Don't sneeze, Correct. open sneeze while you're in a grocery <laughs> store. Like, try to, you know, cover it and maybe right. keep yourself at home when you're sick. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, another thing that I appreciate too, just being here in New York and, and being at the Javis Center is that, you know, we have, you know, members from the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, you know, department, which is actually uh, a, you know, a branch in the military that a lot of people are not uh, familiar with, but pretty much, you know, they focus a lot on public health disease out outbreaks. And so this mm. is their thing here. Mm. And one thing I, I truly appreciate is that, you know, you're always seeing them throughout the whole entire center. They're reevaluating the processes. And I think just within the three weeks of just being here, uh, the process may have changed probably two, maybe three times. And because they're, because for one thing is all, is, is always about protection, making sure all, all the people who are working in this place are protected. Mm -hmm. And if there's any potential window of opportunity of, of anybody getting exposed, they are going to address it. And so they've just been making a lot of tweaks, especially during the PPE area when the clinicians are coming through, they are really observing and monitoring. Uh, because, you know, sometimes we do get some people where they think they remember the steps in the process. They're like, yeah, yeah, I know. You're going to spray my hand and then I'll put my gown on, then you spray my hand, but sometimes they miss a step. And so it's always kind oh, yeah. of going back to, hey, you know, just make sure to listen to those given instructions. And, you know, it'll help the process to move, to move a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, besides that, you know, as I 
walk through the I patient wanna, let's, care. What are we talking about here? You say the Javits Center, is that where you are? Let's talk about that. Sure. I'm very curious. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, are gonna wanna know. If you haven't heard what the Javits Center is, let, let's hear a little bit about what exactly is going on there in New York City at the Javits Center. It's pretty yeah, so it is, it is. Uh, so the Javits Center is really a convention center. Uh, they typically, I believe they have concerts, different events for different organizations or what have you. And basically, um, you know, military, um, you know, public health service, you know, FEMA, I mean, you have probably every major organization, um, you know, in there. And we basically turned it into the New York Javits Center, uh, New York Javits Medical Center. That's what we actually call it. And, um, and so we have um, phases in which we call it. And so in phase one, we can hold up to about 500 beds or 500 patients in there. And then phase two is a thousand. And then phase three goes into another five, uh, 500. So in total should be, um, it should be around 2000 patients that we can actually hold there. And mm -hmm. so uh, one way you, you know that things are getting worse is, you know, if if we're at full capacity in phase one and now we're moving into phase two, then things are really getting bad and patients are not getting better and people are just continuing to get infected. And so for us, um, you know, we've, you know, we've been very lucky to where we haven't tapped into phase two just yet. And so we're still in, in, in phase one. Mm -hmm. So that is a good indication that we're not really admitting um, a whole lot of, a lot of patients. However, every day we are, but it's not to the point to where we are over capacity because you know, every couple of days we are discharging patients, but at the same time, we are receiving a couple of more. And so really the whole purpose, um, you know, as far as you know, setting up the Javits Center as a medical center is to relieve all the local um, surrounding hospitals because you know, as many people probably see on the news, these local hospitals are just getting inundated with COVID patients. And so patients who don't have the virus, uh, they're just not able to get the proper treatment that, that they really need. And mm -hmm. so as we already know, a lot of the elective procedures ha actually have been canceled until further notice because they really want to focus on procedures that that are life-threatening that you know so that way we can uh, put our professionals and resources to to better use but mm -hmm. again but but as far as the javis santa goes it's it's basically have been transformed to to a hospital and yeah. and and to see how quickly um you know all these professionals and military personnel have come together to make that happen has truly has been remarkable and just amazing right i know that's the that's the most heartwarming part in this whole journey that we've taken through this COVID is that, you know, we've been able to, to see folks come together, find creative ways to serve um, the community and this great need that, that we're finding. I mean, the interesting, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that, you know, folks are like, well, these hospitals, they're, they're huge and they've got all, but many hospitals, I mean, I think the average number that I heard um, and even in urban areas is that a hospital has somewhere between 20 and 30 beds in ICU. And you're talking about hundreds in New York City specifically, hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, but hundreds of them flooding each of these hospitals. And right, so, right. you know, you have to re have the, the awareness that most of these hospitals are not set up to cater to that number of patients in an on an emergent basis and when they move into an intensive care unit they mm -hmm. you know, they need they, ha they have special needs and so it is unrealistic to try to convert an entire hospital center that does have as you said elective procedures are being pushed but there are folks that still need to receive care you know if you're right. currently being treated for you know an illness a terminal illness or any sort of <clears throat> you know, any sort of, uh, you know, immuno uh, conditions that you don't really want the worry that you are going to be encountering a lot of these COVID cases when you're going for your, you know, I have a friend who regularly is going for injections um, 
for uh, post chemo injections after you know having uh, breast cancer for a number of, of years. And so the reality is she has to go to the hospital to get these. There's a cancer ward in the hospital, but if she, if this hospital had converted a number of their units into to cater to COVID patients, now there's this worry of exposure right mm -hmm. for her every time that she's needing to go there for care um, right. because you have these healthcare providers that you know they have common areas that they need to 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 join um that they'll be around each other even if they're not necessarily working in that covid unit so i do find it really awesome that you know you 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 see the government and local officials trying to find ways to convert places like the Javits Center, you know, places that aren't getting, <laughs> unfortunately, with this whole situation, there's no business in these big convention centers there. They're right. also ghost towns. So let's put them to use, right? Let's get creative and, and start to put our resources towards really trying to watch these numbers go in the opposite direction. And, and I think that what you're saying too about, you know, having not, not, seen the spike that that the Javits Center was prepared for is mm -hmm. is um is a comforting thing that you know absolutely we aren't hearing a lot of in, in the media unfortunately right. but right. it is you know it's real that we're still losing lives and so that is you know an, an unfortunate and real circumstance but it's it is I think encouraging to hear that, mm -hmm. that we're not seeing what everybody wasn't expecting to see um right so. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, for me, um, I think the sooner uh, this city, but just really this whole country can recover from this, uh, then the sooner we can get back to our normal lives. Because honestly, I think nobody was really expecting for this virus to have such an immense impact on our economy and our life. I mean, people lost their jobs. Uh, financially, people are suffering, mm -hmm. and uh, and again, you, you know, I mean, this is just something that we weren't just prepared for. A lot of companies weren't prepared for it, right? right? And companies so, are even scared. The entire yeah. organizations are are fearful of what's to come or when business will be return to normal if will, if that will happen. And and so I think it's it is real that you know you're finding this shocking state, not just for our personal lifestyles where we feel, you know, a little bit of kind of cabin fever when we get out of our house and do our normal stuff. But the reality mm -hmm. is, is that businesses are afraid to reopen their doors. They're afraid to put people back in place and, right. you know, and rehire, not, not just because of the COVID, just because of the sickness, but really because they're not sure if the money's going to come back. They're, you know, watching business start to, you know, to dwindle over those, those, these last, these last few weeks. Now, when do we see this upswing where things start to kind of be able to, to support an industry or support, you know, a business that, that, you know, might have been, you talk about like health and fitness, you know, I know that a lot of, um, gyms, national gyms that are looking at trying to find a way to strategically reopen. But when you have a large, um, I've heard about the YMCA's, you know, they, they house down here in like the South, they are, they are the place, right? They've got hundreds of team members that work in any given shift, right? So right. if they don't see the membership go back up or if folks aren't coming back to, for, you know, for attendance and, and actually utilizing the services, they start to see the memberships continue to dwindle. Now they're losing money and they put themselves mm -hmm. at risk. And so, you know, I, I get it that it's it's a scary thing, I think, for everybody and in all industries. You know, I'm, I'm excited to see that at least, you know, you think about the folks that are in um, like food services um, that, you know, maybe wouldn't would would not have a, a backup income, you know, something to fall mm -hmm. upon and say, you know, continue to see that the money coming in. I'm excited to see that at least the restaurants in some cases, in many cases, we'll say around, at least around, around here where I am is just in Charlotte area, um, that you find that they have um, continued to in mm -hmm. some way to run business and provide jobs um, and, you know, in creative ways, obviously, you know, right. that are doing right. delivery services that never did delivery, you know, or they are utilizing, like you said, this curbside service. And, and you know, we found, we, one of our favorite Thai restaurants, we absolutely love this place. Um, my husband went to pick up from there, um, 
and I think it was a dinner time. He walks in and they blocked off like a lot of the restaurants here. They have um, specific instructions about how to set up their restaurant first. So they are not the folks are not allowed to go all the way in. So they walk you walk in a number of feet and they have things separated. They also have tape separating to make sure you stay a certain distance and right. they are selling products like yeah. They're selling their, their, um, the Thai like spices, the, um, gotcha. the avocados and mangoes and all these things that they already are getting anyway to prepare right. food. But right. now maybe, you know, you start thinking creatively about how you want to use your kitchen at home. So right. I just think that that is so cool. My husband was talking about a local restaurant chain yesterday that, um, they started converting part of their restaurant into an actually gro grocery setup and also a oh, wow. small one just to, yeah, same thing. Yeah, you know, like, you know, well, we get these products at wholesale. Right. People are going to go to the grocery store for products anyway. Maybe they'll order some meals from us too. Can mm -hmm. we offer both? So yeah. getting creative to find ways to, to, to sustain mm -hmm. business and, yeah, and provide jobs. I, I think that. Absolutely. I I think, and uh, you definitely hit Danelle on the head. It's being uh, nimble and flexible during during these times. Uh, one thing I wanted to hit on too is because, you know, the summer is approaching, and this is conversations that I've had with so many different clinicians here in New York and even back home in Texas. And so I think with here in New York, and I know the governor here, he actually, you know, kind of showed the numbers on on the news and you can see where the number of uh, cases are actually slowing down, which is definitely a good sign. And I think mm -hmm. as the summer approaches, the good thing is that in warmer, you know, weather, this virus doesn't survive. It doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't live well. And so mm -hmm. the expectations is that the numbers are going to go down. But then again, I think some people are also concerned, okay, well, what happens when the fall and the winter comes, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, and I know several states um, are considering opening, opening everything back up with the condition that people wear masks and, you know, of course people continue to practice hand hygiene or whatnot, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens, right? And so even though the, government open up businesses. Um, personally, I don't know if it's truly safe to just, hey, you know, to just kind of go out and about and be in large crowds, right? And so, mm -hmm. and so I think that's something that time will tell, but most importantly is for us to, to not forget uh, the, the, you know, the essential fundamental thing, which is just to practice hand hygiene wash your hand is probably the most effective right. way. Wash your hands, to stay home when you're sick. <laughs> Two big lessons exactly. that I think we, exactly. we hopefully, hopefully we'll all take away. Keep yourself exactly. clean, stay home when you're not feeling well. <laughs> like, yep. Let's Point keep made. the germs to yourself. <laughs> absolutely, uh, absolutely. You know, the other day um, we were social distancing with our neighbors and uh, we have this funny thing, we've got uh, decks and so we, we're all always kind of trying to find ways to hang out. So I have neighbors that play instruments and things. So we'll be out. Um, and, and just trying to have conversation. And, and we've done a couple of virtual game nights, which I think is so cool. Um, but this topic of, of resilience, you know, something that you were just kind of touching on there is it, it's really, it's really awesome, really incredible. And, and, um, and in, I think encouraging even for our kids to see that in the face of all of this kind of uncertainty and emotional turmoil that we're all feeling, there is still, I think, quite a bit of, of an ex strong expression of resilience. You know, you see that no matter what, you know, it takes me back to 9-11, to you know, that was a real life situation for me right. as a kid. And I think we were all so afraid, didn't know. Then there was this topic of war and, you know, all of this kind of shocking stuff that makes you feel like, oh my gosh, I just want to curl up in a ball and give all, give up. You know, I think that yeah. so many folks are, are finding creative ways. Just yesterday was my mother-in-law's birthday. And, you know, this is, I know you've probably seen, and many of you have seen these images of like, you know, people doing really cool things yeah. to show their love for their loved right. ones at a distance, even if, you know, that means that they're miles, hundreds and thousands of miles away, they're finding a way to say, I still want to 
be a part of humanity and I want to show my humanness. And like you're talking about people flocking to a place where they're suffering and finding a way to be supportive, even in the midst of that fear. And again, the uncertainty that, that I'm sure you and many of the other um, volunteers that are that are there as well or, or service members are also feeling you know I think it's just really cool to just see that resilience that that strength everybody's yeah. desire to push forward to continue Absolutely. to persevere and move beyond all of this you know I think yeah. it is yeah. hard to see the end because we're all saying we don't know when it's gonna end nobody knows everyone's like right. when officially does the quarantine end like no <laughs> one knows like there's is there even a date like well right. at least technically right. you said 30 days you know like we we don't have any idea we just got the call on Friday um here in our county that our kids aren't going back to school North Carolina's been you know kind of we have we've had numbers of course of deaths and and cases but i think that they you know very optimistic that we'll at least get the kids back in for the last month of school or something like that. Um, but we got the call and it was like, oh, you know, that heartbreaking, like, man, sure. mostly for the, I, I think about the kids that are like seniors in high school and, you know, yeah, missing out on those really big memories and moments that we all, you know, hope for. But I, I, I find it so cool that these schools even getting creative about finding ways to engage the kids. My son's school did this cute parade thing where it's like parents had to stay a certain you know distance, but the, the teachers de decorated their cars <laughs> and <laughs> drove through the neighborhood, some of them blasting music, you know, out their loudspeakers right. and driving through all the neighborhoods that are zoned for the school and just celebrating. Like let's, That's it awesome. was spirit week, you know? So they were trying yeah. to, how do we engage our kids without you know, getting them. So you weren't allowed to be, you know, in a crowd or anything like that, but you could be out front of your house as long as you practice, you know, the, the, the distance Social requirements. Distance. Right. Right. And right. so, but I find that, you know, this, it's just cool to, I think it's really exciting for the kids to see it. Like, it is. you know, even though we've got all of this, like my friend, like I mentioned to you, our neighbors, you know, we, we, we're very social people. So our neighbors and we, we all get together. We love to be around each other. It's usually music, game night, whatever, just to hang. And our kids are like the other day, um, one of our, he's probably 13 or so, one of our neighbor's sons walks by and he's like, I can't wait until we're like able to go back to your house and, and, um, and actually do game night real life. But it's so cool yeah. to do it online. And I mean, yeah, cool. it's been so great. Like, you know, technology is such a gift. God it is not have this <laughs> we didn't have we had this go on 20 years earlier i don't know, I know. What done. <laughs> no absolutely and you know when you said technology you made me remember something too you know another thing that i also remember too just kind of seeing as i walk around in the patient care area and at, at the javits center just patients able to facetime or even just call their loved ones you know um, you know, just seeing patients just constantly on their own. And however, the staff are really working hard to do a good job as far as, um, you know, checking up on them, making sure that they're okay. But most of and I mean, yeah, just even giving them cell phone chargers so that they can right. charge their phone so that way they can text and call right. a family right. member. But again, with technology and just staying connected is, is such an important piece to this uh, situation as well. So. It is. Yeah. So grateful to everybody who's pushed to get technology in the hands of our clinicians in these hospitals that, you know, don't have infrastructure for that. I think it's so cool that they would even think about the importance of being yeah. able to see their family members on a screen or speaking to them and having yeah. these conversations. I mean, you know, whether or not their lives are at officially at risk, I think that right. the, the reality is, is there's a comforting to knowing that your family is okay, that, you know, they're getting the care that they yeah. need and that even the folks outside of the hospital know that you love them. Like there, there needs right. to be this, this kind of, I think, way for us to soothe that that kind of uh, emotional uproar that starts to happen when you realize you can't mm -hmm. speak to your loved one you can't you know it causes more stress and tension which is counter to health and and being able to recover so I correct think really cool. and you know what so there's uh one of my uh um i guess colleagues here i would say you know she you know she's a nurse and she works on the floor 
and she shared this with uh, the group of people that, 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 that actually stays on, on the floor here, uh, where we're staying at in the hotel. And what she was telling us is that uh, th there were, you know, a couple, uh, there were, I think, maybe in the 60s or 70s, mm -hmm. both of them ended up getting um, the coronavirus. And they were here at the, at the Javits Center. And uh, the, the, the wife passed away. And I think maybe a day or two later, the husband found out and went and, and when he did, he basically told the physicians that there's no reason for me to live on anymore. Mm. You know, my wife is gone. I have nobody else. Just take me off of the ventilator. And Jeez. that was tough, and, you know, and uh, of course, um, the physicians, you know, fulfilled his will and, uh, you know, he passed away mm. and, uh, you know, it just, it just kind of goes to show that, you know, these people, man, when they are, and then the sad thing about it is that, you know, they're in, um, I guess a little cubicle type, type structure where they're just there by themselves, right? Mm. Cause you're sick, you have the virus, you have to be quarantined, right? You can't be, you know, you know, with, with no other patients, you, it's just you by yourself, your family can't come see you. And so just, you know, as you alluded to with the anxiety, the emotions, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're scared. So there's just so many things kind of going through their mind. And like I said, I think the clinicians, they do a great job just comforting them and just really being by their mm -hmm. side. But, you know, just hearing that story, I mean, it really, yeah, you know, it really touched my heart because I can only imagine what the wife and the husband were just kind of going right. through, not not being able to be by each other's side. And so it just kind of goes to show you the seriousness of this virus um, because, you know, every patient is hooked up on a ventilator. I mean, uh, and, at the, and you know, majority of them are, are, are older patients and you just see the difficulty that they have some of them are doing a little bit better than others, but then some of them, you could just see the struggle. Um, but again, it's just a constant reminder of, you know, to take this thing seriously, to continue to, you know, hand hygiene. And, and you know, when you think about it, protecting yourself is really not that hard. It's all, it's all about, you know, just making that conscious effort to do, to do those things. But, you know, being carelessness and not following the, the proper protocols can definitely put anybody um, um, in, in harm's way and potentially right. contract that virus. So. It's true. I mean, it's, it's a, it, there's so many stories like that, I'm sure. And that's the, the part that I think is the hardest to follow right now. You know, yeah. I, I, you know, think about these you know, I'm in, in my 30s, right? And you know, these kids have got a younger brother who's in his 20s and, you know, they just, they're invincible, right? And I say this too, that, you know, I 100% I, I understand it because I think that, you know, a slight shift in perspective is yeah. you, you're just one step away from saying whatever, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I went into conversation with, with a girlfriend of mine just about this topic, you know, are you afraid? Are you, you know, about getting it and so on? And the reality is, is that the truth about it is whether or not I have fears about contracting the illness or anything that really doesn't it matter because I think my understanding of humanity and that small sense of compassion leads me to first act on. I worry more about whether I make other people ill. Like if yeah. I get it, would, would I get my family sick? Would I not be able to, to, you know, kind of feel good about when I'm able to be out in the world again, this in fear of exposing other people to that illness. So I think the, the behavior being modeled after your love for other people, the caring for other people, even if you don't yourself, you know, you feel like you're super healthy and you're young and no big deal, um, you know, which we've all heard stories that that seemingly you know can have no significance whatsoever but the reality is that you know whether or not you care about your mortality we'll just say that straight up the reality is is that you shouldn't you shouldn't be yeah. careless enough to just say your life doesn't matter and i'm going to live my life in whatever way i want to 
Um, and so, you know, I think that that for me is the, that that's the proper response, whether or not, you know, you, you believe, oh, this is a disease and it's made up by people and all this other stuff that we're hearing, <laughs> you know, theories. oh yeah, all these theories, <laughs> you know, oh, they, they, they created the disease and whatever. Like, I don't, it doesn't even matter. Like at this point, who cares? People are getting sick. People are dying. What do we do? And to probably yeah. have a response that is respectful and I think Agreed. mindful of, of our fellow human. Right? Absolutely. Definitely to agree. Definitely to agree. Yeah. And so again, I think, you know, the biggest lesson learned here, um, you know, it's washing your hands, practicing social distancing um, and, uh, you know, wear a mask. Uh, since this is a you know a virus and it's going to easily be spread through droplets of so sneeze and cough or so whatnot, um, you know we just have Aerosol, to just take so yeah <laughs> right Aerosol. right there I'm you like, go exactly. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. But ab absolutely. And so, you know, I don't expect us to be here much longer because, again, the numbers are going down. Things are looking a lot better. And actually, a lot more stores are, are, are starting to open up. Yesterday, when I took a walk, um, you know, towards the Javits Center, I, I saw a lot more people than what I typically would see on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's almost as if you see that turn, you know, that turnaround on the positive side is actually starting to come and so the more people you see then ho then you know hopefully you know it is it is a sign of a of, of positive but the good thing I can say you do see a lot of people walk around with masks mm -hmm. so they're definitely okay. taking the proper precautions for sure good yeah I think at a place like New York that's important that 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 you know those kind of habits continue especially so here in Charlotte you know if we're going out for a walk we're not going to really encounter there might be moments when you're crossing paths with people and that would you know my my daughter jokes around and she like holds her breath you know like, we'll look past and she you know like you know you would she's like oh it's like when you would pass like a, a cemetery yeah. but, you know when you're driving by you hold your breath and <laughs> so she holds her breath for as long as she can um until right. we pass them you know and i and, and that's the the truth is, is that we're we're blessed to have more mm -hmm. space between us and our neighbor um versus yeah. in a place like new york where you know it everybody on top of each other exactly it's tight yeah. I'll say that it's tight and so yeah I mean people go walk back to the streets and and you know I mean it's hard to yeah. to to keep six feet <laughs> between you Absolutely. and the other person um in, in a place like New York City so um so I do think right keeping these precautions in place for sure in urban areas where you're going to be encountering a lot of people keep the the masks on making sure that you know you stay home when you're sick <laughs> so. okay Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So let's talk, let's talk about like what, what kind of good stuff do we think is going to come out of this? I mean, you know, there's so many stories, like we talked about, you know, the, the, the beautiful ways that people are finding ways to celebrate their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, you hear so many stories of, oh, my families live way on the other side of the world and whatever. And you, never maybe thought to FaceTime your grandmother or like, right. you know, get right. everybody on like a big family call. So I just find that so cool and, and inspiring that, you know, breaking through the barriers of the fears of technology that might have kept, you know, grandma and grandpa away from the devices and, and they're like, oh, just give me a regular cell phone, whatever. Now they're like, okay, let's Zoom, whatever that means. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> you know, and I think it's cool that there's maybe a reframing of these relationships um, that maybe says, doesn't matter if through space, through time, I'm going to find a way to, mm -hmm. to show my love to you and to be present with you, even if it means that I have to do that through a screen. Right, you know? right. No, absolutely. So. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, you pretty much said it, uh, using technology, the FaceTiming approach. When I think about healthcare, um, when telehealth first came out, you had a, a lot of people, even, you know, physicians, they didn't think that was good quality care and that, mm -hmm. you know, this telehealth would never pan out. But since this whole COVID situation came out, this was the answer for providers to still see their patients and insurances. They basically say, we will reimburse you as if the patients are, are actually in the clinic. And so now a lot of providers are saying, this is a game changer for us now, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and which, which also adds flexibility 
to, you know, their practice. Um, and then, you know, again, just with people, right? The, you know, people, you know, that are older, maybe 50 or 60 and above who were not really open to, you know, FaceTiming or using, you know, you know, that form of technology. Now it's almost as if this COVID situation is kind of forcing us to, to, to really adapt and overcome. And I think it's great, you know, for, for you know, for the for the economy, for business, for people in general. And so, I think a company like Zoom is, I'm sure, they are seeing their revenue skyrocket because oh, yeah. of this. You know what I mean? And so, this is great stuff. I love it. It really is, and I I 100% am with you that you know this telehealth. Um, I know what we'll see is some mm-hmm. sort of revolution, some now reinvigoration oh, yeah. of uh, uh, like this opening of eyes, you know, there's so many corporations and organizations. I was listening to one of my, my favorite speakers, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk the other day, and he was speaking about how um, for co- some companies like his, he's global, they've always used technology, no big deal. But the reality for a lot of these companies, medical practices even, mm-hmm. who have never utilized technology, they don't even have a voice over IP connection for phones to be able to right. forward calls effectively and, 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 um, and manage them that, you know, maybe using a kind of an old school connection for just a, you know, for a phone system, just something as simple as that, being right. able to utilize a software connection that is pot- potentially online or on the cloud, a lot of them bound to a server system that has no ability for them to even virtually connect to it or securely connect to it um, off-site, you know, so those types of things. And then God forbid, like folks that are doing things still mostly on paper or using like a lot of um, antiquated ways, right, to manage. I say that like lightly because I mean, I still know practices that they have a book scheduling book that they utilize, like, you know, and that is real stuff right so it's now shifting where they they might have been years behind maybe even decades behind right and now they are being thrust thrust forward to like where we are in Mm -hmm. our current world and needing to use technology and heavily rely on technology right Right. Um, and so it is kind of it's it is um i in a sense it's just very uh I guess, humbling to recognize that like everybody in the world at the same time is finding and experiencing the struggle. So it's a, it is the best time I would say for somebody to be thrust, right? Because Mm -hmm. we're all more, I think we are all more patient than we would have ever been, you know? Correct. I'm hearing even on these IVRs, um, Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, sorry, the like interact, the the phone systems, right? Interactive voice response. When you hear it, when you hear an automated um, recording on the voice, I've heard many of them recently that are saying things like, you know, please excuse any background noises you might hear, you know, unusual sounds that you might hear. All of our workers are, are working remotely or working from home, right? right like, you right. know, where, where before, you, if you heard a dog bark or a baby cry, you'd probably be like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so unprofessional. You know, now right. you're like, whatever, COVID, you know, real talk, like everybody's at home and their kids are next to them and their dogs are with them. And, and so, you know, that's, that I think is a really interesting, I think, shift even for, you know, folks that I work with in my industry is, you know, my environment, um, corporately, you know, we find that I think there's always been a little bit of a divide where you find, you know, oh yeah, these, these certain types of folks, they could do well working from home, but others, maybe not work ethic might not be there. We're probably not for that particular job description or function or whatever. And now it's, well, everybody's there. Productivity is still up and our folks, maybe their productivity has, ticked up a little bit because Correct. now we have less that we're doing like we're, we're at home right so now you you might see a little bit more production out of your team and so there's this i think trust that we're being that's being built where maybe this changes the way that jobs are offered right Absolutely. maybe this changes the way that we look at healthcare and the way that it's structured where 
maybe if instead of me for my normal check-in appointment or me getting a refill for my prescription and the doc just needs to find out a get a couple of answers to questions maybe i can have a telehealth visit where i don't have to drive 30 minutes to my doctor's office sit for two hours you know collectively over the course of that that visit and then just be like have five minutes of face time with my provider to sign a prescription and send me on my way maybe that doesn't have to be my reality and so I, I, that part I think is so cool that everybody at the same time, I think is trusting in it more. We're going to start finding ourselves, maybe even embracing it more. Right. Um, you know, right. you, this topic of even providers, like thinking differently about how to structure their practices. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have a provider or two or three that they that's have. what they do. And I absolutely, um, you know, as we sit here and, you know, just hearing you talk and, you know, you and I, we kind of mentioned this before, there's so many topics that's going to come out, you know, mm -hmm. from this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yeah, you're right. Um, especially as we continue to be forward thinkers, um, especially from the healthcare standpoint, and this is where telehealth is going to play such, such a crucial role, right? Because God forbid, but let's say, um, we get a second wave of mm -hmm. COVID, right? People, you know, let's say by the fall, right? People are getting reinfected again. And, and now we just have a massive chaos. I think we'll be well equipped and prepared for it because now, uh, you know, a lot of physician practices actually closed down mm -hmm. because they were just not prepared for this, right? right? But with a lot of providers now getting involved with, you know, telehealth, now, is this going to be just a simple shift, you know, just mm -hmm. a simple notification to their patient, letting them, letting them know that, hey, we're shifting back to telehealth for this time being and just continue, you know, running their practice virtually um, right. you know, you know, as if nothing really changed. So it's going to be a very interesting time. So I'm excited. It about is. It. it is. You know, I, I this bring, just reminded me of this conversation I had um, that, that how telehealth used to be a bad word you're like oh, oh yeah. you're, like oh you are doing telehealth you don't have time for your patients i see like or you <laughs> you know trying to pretend offer fake services right like that was kind of how it was looked at um and so now we see the payers changing their perspective but i, I heard some, someone say um to me recently changing the language to saying providing virtual care like we're not we're not just using the phone we're not we are trying to find ways to actually care for our patients right. we're going to use means that are a bit more flexible for everybody mind you it's not just the provider sure. it's i think even more so it's flexibility for many patients right mm -hmm. and you you add to this 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 layer of of technology being more supportive where everybody has access to wearables and you're finding a lot more um, technology, you know, blooming where folks are looking at ways to monitor certain vitals and, and just basic lifestyle choices that are now easier for them to report back to their doctor instead of an old school, like keep a food journal. And, you know, like <laughs> there's a li little bit more how, how frequently you're exercising. The doctor can say, see, I saw your health app right. and you're right. only exercising once a week or, you know, you or you've only gotten your heart rate up to this, you know, uh, once or twice a month. You know, this, I think those, the, the reality is that you can actually provide this, this idea of care, right? Instead of, so healthcare, right? The, the real element, the real uh, function of the term healthcare versus sick care. Right. And you actually can maintain hopefully a little bit of, of well being in your patients for right. the ones that have the desire to be, to, you know, to keep that health and wellness up. And then maybe you can do more to encourage it. Absolutely. If you have this accessibility, right? The patients, maybe they don't have the time really, their schedules are crazy and hectic, but they might have that five to 20 minutes in their day to be able to plug into a device. You know, all everybody right. seems to manage to find that with this, all the different social media apps that we have, right? We all find like 20 minutes in our day somehow, yeah. or, you know, multiple sets of 20 minutes in our day for people who are a, a little <laughs> addicted <laughs> to their devices. So, you know, I think that it's kind of cool that, that, you know, you could see, I think both sides really being able to, to thrive with this topic of this virtual care, being able to utilize technology to support the health and well-being of our communities. Correct, because what you're talking about, uh, what comes to mind is access to care. 
I mean, it's just it's just another level of access. And mm-hmm. and and the nice thing about it, right? It really doesn't matter where you are because I know telehealth was really, you know, being used for more so a lot of remote areas where they don't have a lot of providers. But now it just changed the I mean the playing field. So it really shouldn't matter. Um and 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 you know, and I'm sure this will be a different topic too, right? Um, because you know, they are because I've been in the healthcare industry for about 13, 14 years now. And you know, when I think about patients who have Medicaid um, or just you know insurance that that really doesn't pay well, uh, oftentimes they have to drive far just to go see you know a particular provider because that provider may be the only one in the area that. Right. Is willing to see a Medicaid patient, mm-hmm. but now with the telehealth, you know, as we mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, they can sit at the comfort of their home and uh, right. see, you know, a provider who may be an hour or an hour and 30 minutes away. So, uh, right. and so that's why I'm really excited about it. It's true. I mean, and access to care is exactly the word, the, the, the phrase for it, the term for it, because, you know, we talk about these environments where people are living in more rural communities yeah. and, you know, in, like the farm workers and things like that, you know, these folks are up at way before dawn, right? Four and five in the morning. They're working until sunset sometimes, right? They're working all day. So when is it that they're going to make it to the doctor, right? When is it that they're actually going to have the ability to say, I'm going to take off for a few days or a few hours out of my day to be able to go to the doctor's visits that I need to, to attend to, right? I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's a few specialists and, and then a regular, you know, um, uh, family wellness provider, you know? So I, I, you think about the the reality of this, this shift that could change for, for many people. And now we have the, the well-being and, and health kind of at the forefront of our minds for even our um, most destitute communities, the, the communities that really need this, this care. So, yeah. Correct. Absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely. No. So, uh, so I, I want to talk a couple of more things that like coming to mind, right? We're shifting back to this, the good may come of it, you know, uh, this, so I, I'm going to be really frank, right? It is not all rainbows and butterflies for many married couples <laughs> and kids at home. I recognize that, okay? It is not all lovey-dovey where yeah. you're like, oh, yeah. I get so much quality time with my <laughs> loved ones. This is so great. Um, we all don't feel that way, okay? Uh, this is real talk, right? We all know <laughs> that like there was like, a nice little break that you had in your work day when you got to leave and then you got home and there was this moment of, Oh, now I've actually missed you. Thank goodness. Like, (laughs) but now there's not as much of an opportunity, right? We are around our loved ones that, you know, we share homes with. We're around the clock, right? So, I mean, there's some, some unfortunate, you know, circumstances that start to take root, you know, the realities of, of domestic violence and, and, you know, some of these communities that are not, um, is healthy in their family life environment, And so, you know, there's a real, a real kind of concern from, from my side about that. But when I think about the more positive spin <laughs> on this, which is, you know, the, kind of, again, the reframing is, is a lot of our communities may be seeing things a little different, right? So where as I drove two hours to work, maybe I'm so leaving the house at before, before 6 a.m. and my kids haven't even gotten themselves up and out to school. I don't see them right? And I get home because I got out at 6 p.m. and then I'm commuting two hours and now it's eight o'clock. Everybody else in my house, maybe they ate, maybe they didn't because they didn't have, you know, food wasn't ready yet or what have you. I didn't make it home. My wife, you know, my wife, my husband didn't make it home, you know, um, and, and, uh, and I'm not able to get home to cook a delicious warm cooked meal. So I get home and my kids have about two minutes to scarf down their food before they've got to get themselves reset back for their next school day, right? So there's just this kind of this constant struggle to find a balance between how do I spend quality time with my family? How do I provide a meal like that's actually maybe made at home or at least where we sit down together, even if you don't cook it at home, like no, not trying to pretend like I, you know, you got to bake all your meals at home. I'm not that person. So, <laughs> I mean, it's all, but if the real is the real, the reality is, is that even just to be able to sit down and say, hello, right. how was your day? Like that is a gift. It's a huge gift. 
And so subtract four hours from my day. If that was my reality, I have four hours back in my day. Even if I didn't choose to take those four hours to do anything related to cooking or anything of that kind of whatever home, home life, um, that, you know, the, the homemaking life, we'll say that. Um, even if you didn't do that, the reality is, is you get to maybe be a bit more present, just even in your home, right? To feel like, I see my kids. I get to look them in the eye in the morning and say good morning to you besides the Saturday and the Sunday gift, you know? So I think that hopefully is the, the, the reality that, I, that I'm, I'm hopeful that a lot of families are experiencing. And, and that's definitely been our reality. I mean, you know, my, my, uh, my, four, my 15 year old, she's probably not excited about it every morning, you know, <laughs> both of us being around, the little brother around and, and all that. And then I make her come down to my office and she does her work down here with me. Um, and so, but it's, it's a gift, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't expecting to be homeschooling a, a freshman in, in high school, but, <laughs> but it's kind of a really cool thing to have a little bit of an opportunity to say like, hey, like this is kind of like summer, but it doesn't feel as uncomfortable, I think, as summer. Because summertime, I would have to still go for my four hours of the day and I'm rushing off and the kids are at home. You're trying to find ways to keep them busy versus now we're kind of all in this together. So Correct. Yeah. Correct. You couldn't have said it any better. And uh, yeah, and you know, you know, I think about um you know, for me, I mean, even before the whole coronavirus situation, you know, just, you know, working for corporate healthcare, and eventually, you know, once I, you know, decided to step out on my own and work for myself, it was nice just to be home, right, to be able to, you know, see my daughter and my wife off to work in school, uh, to be an all pro dad at my daughter's school, mm-hmm. you know, to be present and do the things that I wouldn't have been able to do. And now with this whole, whole Corolla situation, uh, for the time being, you know, just being home with them um, and just, uh, you know, being a part of, you know, you know, as you mentioned, right. I mean, you're home homeschooling your daughter and, you know, just helping my daughter with her schoolwork and just seeing how she's learning and progressing. So that time was fun, but of course I'm here in New York now. So it's just my wife back home with the kids, but right. again, reality. I think, so I, yeah, I think, and, and, and also too, before I left, uh, one thing we would do all the time every day uh, for the most part i would say we made uh sure that we would just kind of walk around the block as a family together and you know whether it's you know teaching my daughter how to ride her bike which she eventually got the hang of it so now yeah. she's training wheels but it was so nice and you know just seeing other families doing the same thing and right. getting getting that chance to even talk with with another family that we probably would have never you know had the opportunity because you know you're working and it's like after work you come home and you just stay inside and you get ready for the next day and it's really like constantly a, going constantly running right right so mm-hmm. but yeah it's nice it's yeah nice. i think you know what the cool thing is is that you know everybody's like talks about the numbers with the screen time and how people are way more into tech but the reality is i think we all are we all have hit our limit mm-hmm. where we're like we need life <laughs> like life outside of the house so we're, we're getting close to that, that most of the families, you know, are, are I think finding really creative ways to yeah. just get out into the world in whatever way that they can. And so maybe that's walking through the woods, taking a little, you know, stroll around the block or making it a habit that you take the bike rides. Like my son, and I'm sure, you know, this is the age because we we both have six-year-olds. So, you know, the we're, we're at that age where a lot of kids are, are getting out of the the training wheels right but it's like every other day my son's on his zoom in the morning he's there every morning but almost every other day there's a new child that's like what's your good news today and she knows it's the whole thing and he's like i i I didn't i rode my bike without training wheels like it's like all that he's got a big class my son has a big class but almost all the kids i think now are not riding with training wheels which is so cool you know that that usually something that might happen during a summertime break or spring break or something right you have you know, kind of blossoming of relationship and in such a cool way. And again, creating new memories, like opportunities to to find ways to maybe creatively do that quality time with your kids, you know, like my, my um, husband and son have been doing artwork on the, 
on the um, driveway and the um, sidewalk and stuff like every at least once or twice a week. And, um, you know, they're finding cool things to do for school. Like his, my son has to represent um, numbers in some visual way. And so instead of doing it on paper, they're out on the, in the chalk <laughs> doing that representation of the numbers of the, of the week or day or whatever. I don't, he's been the one who's doing the homeschooling with my, with my six-year-old, to be honest. <laughs> I'm already in meetings by the time their his day gets started. So, um, but it's such a, it's such a gift to, to have that chance to be out there, you know, hands dirty in the chalk, you know, crawling on the ground, playing in the, um, playing the chalk. So it's really cool. Awesome. Oh, yeah. so cool. I like it. <laughs> so let's talk. I, wa I want you to share a little bit about your experience. You, you, you went from Texas to New York. How was your flight? You know, the flight, um, honestly, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, and to be honest, right, uh, you know, with this whole COVID situation, I would always kind of read things online, but hardly watch the news. And so when I went to the airport, I was, I guess, shocked. And again, I wasn't shocked to see how empty the airport was. I mean, I, uh, I could run around the whole airport. I mean, nobody probably would even see anything. I mean, it was just empty. And so- um, Were shops and things like that open? I'm just curious where no, they, they were closed. No, they were closed. I mean, it's like you would go in, check your bag in, your luggage, and you go through TSA. And, you know, being in the military, uh, whenever you travel, you, you do go through um, a pre-check, TSA pre-check, right? What a gift, by the way. That's, that yes. pre-check is. <laughs> yeah. Look, y'all, if you don't have pre-check, pre you need to get pre-check. It's only like $85. We'll <laughs> be grateful. Okay. Yes, highly recommended for sure. But in this case, they didn't even have pre-check because the lines were like down to none. Oh. So it was, I, I mean, honestly, if traveling could be this way every time, I would be flying everywhere. <laughs> I, mean, I just got through in a matter of seconds. Um, so that was really nice about it. And uh, once I got up to my gate, I think it was probably a total of maybe eight, 10 of us. Mm -hmm. And 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 while I was waiting, um, I was hearing one of the um, you know pilots guys. You know he was waiting for because the plane was getting cleaned out. I mean, you know these planes they're literally flying with nobody in it because you know because they have to fly to another state if they have at least one person flying somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So and so on my plane, we probably had a total of eight to 10 people. So I had like maybe two or three rows in front and behind me just empty. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of course the people that were flying, they did have masks on. So I definitely appreciated of that. But again, in my mind, I'm like, man, if somebody cough, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> And I hate to think about it, but it's true because I'm just like, man, I just left my family. I don't want to be in a situation where somebody cough and now, uh, and I get it, you know? So, but again, you can't even go to work. You can't even help people. You just got to go in quarantine for 14 days. I know, I know, but, um, but it was good. And even when I got to Philadelphia, it was the same thing. Airports just empty. And so traveling was really easy. It was simple. I had no issue whatsoever. And, uh, you know, I was really grateful and, and unfortunate about that. So, but, but again, I mean, it just goes to show you that, you know, a lot of people are staying home. They're not, you know, traveling. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting. I think as some states open up, it's going to be interesting to see whether uh, from the airline standpoint, if people are starting to fly again. I'm, I'm curious, you know, um, so you mentioned about the coughing thing. Well, let's share, I'm going to quick share about this. Right before all of this hit, so I had been frequently traveling to and from California, um, and just before, I guess it was the very end of February, um, just before they started to stop flights and things started to kind of fall apart, I actually was scheduled for a trip to Boston when everything started really f shutting down. Um, <clears throat> but the day I'm leaving California, it had only been really in the West, on the West Coast at this point, right? Um, when, you know, we experienced the, the first couple of cases there on the West Coast and then the numbers growing in, in California. So I'm there leaving um, San Diego and, you know, 
everybody, I think, is more aware. Airport, normal, nothing different there yet. Um, but we're all more aware. And so I get on the flight and, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I usually travel, I always travel with at least sanitizer and I usually travel with wet ones, you know, those um, antibacterial wipes and stuff. Um, Cause I'm a little, yeah, I told you my mom, <laughs> I am a daughter of a germaphobe. Okay. So my mom has brought it to my awareness of, you know, the possibilities, right. When you're like thinking you're going to travel for a six hour flight, you think, Oh, I'm probably going to need a snack or I'm probably going to need whatever. So I had already committed to, I would not be eating on the flight. I knew that. Um, but then I sit down and the guy next to me has his wife in front of him, um, in the row in front of him. And they're passing like a thing of Clorox wipes back and forth to wipe down. And I'm like, all I kept thinking was, man, I am going to touch my face or something. And I'm going to touch the seat or whatever. And, and I'm like thinking this is going to be, and, and literally at that moment, he, he and I had already had a, a, you know, good morning conversation and he offers me a Clorox wipe. And I thought, thank you. Like, how great are you? And so I'm wiping down my whole space and I'm like, you know, okay, I'm still not eating. Like I'll probably put something on this tray, like water or something, but I'm not eating anything for sure. But as I'm sitting on the flight, I'm like, you're, you hear noises, right? You, you hear the noises of, oh, by the way, full flight, completely full, not even a, a seat open. <clears throat> and you hear coughing, Oh man. Yeah, you hear sounds and I'm like, oh my God, like the moment someone coughs, I'm like my daughter, right? I'm like my daughter. How long can I hold my breath? How long should I hold my breath? And you're like, every time. And there was definitely someone on the flight that she was yeah. too sick. I don't know, you know, we don't know at that point. It's too early. Nobody was testing and saying anything officially. Um, but it, you know, definitely she had something. So hopefully, you know, it, it, she didn't get her whole couple of rows six she was probably maybe four or five rows behind me but you know the whole flight all I kept thinking was this is gonna be and then I and then I got home and I had a bug I actually was sick I, I thankfully still earlier on in this whole thing that I really don't know because there weren't tests available and I wasn't going to be my first response um, but I did you know take precautions and kind of stay until I started feeling better and said okay it was only like two days worth of me not yeah. feeling well so but you know Thankfully, that was, you know, two months ago now. So I don't think that, you know, at least I don't believe it was COVID. Who knows, though? I mean, the reality is, is that you really, the, the, the symptoms have been so, it, it's just different for everybody. Like, I mean, I've had some friends that have told me they've got it and they were like a couple of days, they were feeling tired and fatigued and coughing and then back to normal. And then you hear that, you know, very, very intense symptoms. And so, um, but yeah, I am grateful for the idea that yeah. <laughs> airplanes are hopefully creating new protocol yeah. <laughs> that I really hope sticks. You know, I started joking. I was talking to you the other day about the, the reality that everybody always, everyone talks about jokingly how disgusting airplanes are that, you know, there's like all kinds of stuff on the seats and on the headrest and everything. You're like, what? And we ride in this like for like hours, some people taking 20 hour flights and you know, you got to get cozy with your seat. Like, you know, it becomes your home for a while. So, I mean, I think that it's pretty cool that hopefully fingers crossed that these airlines decide to keep a little bit of this cleanliness and precautions and maybe realizing they don't need to overstuff flights to be successful. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if anything, I just hope that they are spraying some type of disinfectant spray on the seats, mm -hmm. everything, you know, just to keep everybody safe. But um, I would think, I would think that they would be doing something like this. And again, I think moving forward, I truly believe every company, it doesn't matter what it is, should adopt some type of, um, you know, some type of policy from a industrial hygiene standpoint to to truly, you know, uh, just disinfect and just, you know, clean the areas of bacteria and germ and potential viruses because, right. uh, again, something like coronavirus that was, you know, potentially underestimated, I mean, it could wipe out an economy, you know, and, 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 and another thing I was telling somebody too is just goes to show you how quickly um, uh, financially people can, can go broke, right? I mean, I think in a matter of weeks, I mean, people are living a paycheck or two away before. Yeah. Yeah, here's, right. here's the reality. 
is it not just people, right? It's companies. Yes. Yes. Exactly. To choose from being broke. And that I think is the, the scary reality of this environment that I think that we will take away that lesson of, of, you know, I, I'm a big Dave Ramsey person, right? I love, <laughs> I love Dave Ramsey. So, you know, six months, the, you know, you got to go through the baby steps, do the debt freedom. And then you got to at least, you know, at least an emergency fund of some size, yes. three to six months of something real for you and your family. It just gives so much peace of mind to know that I could even last two months without any income, like just that reality. Even if you didn't get up to the six months of savings, just to know that you have enough to care, cover your basic necessities for these two months and you wouldn't feel a difference except right. for looking for the next, you know, since source of income, which I think is, is just, a, I think a positive exercise for everybody. Yeah. I definitely agree. Highly recommended. And, and you know what, maybe this might be an opportunity for Dave Ramsey to create something for businesses, right? I mean, create reserves of funds just in case when, you know, econ economy is not going the way it is, at least companies can still, you know, pay their employees and make the necessary adjustments to adapt and overcome. Mm -hmm. Yep. On that note, I, I look little plug for, uh, for Dave Ramsey, because yeah. yesterday he has this, um, this podcast that he offers that is um, is for if you guys are, are familiar maybe with Entre Leadership is a program that he has and just these last few episodes have been specifically around you know getting creative in your business trying to find ways to pick up the pieces and rebuild something that if it wasn't sustainable in COVID how do you build something that is sustainable in COVID so these are all really cool things that I think you and I are going to really dive into in these next few episodes from a healthcare perspective so that people start to really understand how to take these lessons that, that you know, we've all learned, painful lessons that we've learned from this whole COVID experience. How do we change that and now create a, a, a practice or a healthcare environment that hopefully is stronger? Because the reality is, is that you, know, you got into healthcare for a reason, right? You have a desire to continue to help. So if you know that something is shocking our world, our, our healthcare system in such a way, people are getting sick, they need care. So how do you continue to provide that much needed care? You know, I mean, yeah, there might be some services that you provide that are somewhat elective, but the reality is, is that, you know, people still need their mammograms. They still need to go for these normal checkup visits because now then we might see this extra stress and this added anxiety that pushes people into a state of illness and, 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 um, and sickness. So you need to find a way to hopefully keep the strength in your business to continue providing those services to your patients in whatever way is possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. I definitely do agree with that. So we'll see. We'll see how things continue to progress for sure. But uh, these are definitely interesting times and uh, making the necessary adjustments is going to be key just to survive it and just overcome it. And, uh, um, and I'm sure a lot of changes will be made in all industries, but especially in healthcare for sure. Absolutely. Well, I am excited about this. I'm so grateful that we have launched into this podcast. We, you know, we had a whole other set of initial topics we were going to dive into. And I think that this is great. I, I hope that our listeners find it, it helpful too, just to have a dialogue about healthcare and, and this world that we live in as it relates to, to healthcare and, and real talk, not, not a bunch of media fluff. This is just our experience, you know, we, we live healthcare every day um, on the ground and also on the business side, both of us heavily on the business side of healthcare. So being able to speak from our experience, I hope that, that you guys have found it um, valuable in some way. Um, so yes, well, so next week, <clears throat> Our next episode, we're, we're talking about um, le learning kind of takeaways, right? What did we learn? You'll, we'll dive a little bit more into this PPE, this topic of protective equipment, and how do you use this lesson that we've learned, very, very powerful one that we've all figured out that we need these basic hygiene habits. How do we take those and maybe integrate them in some way into the practice, into the, the normal kind of healthcare practice? Uh -huh. but, I cover that, right? Is that right? Is that, yes, that is that correct. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Exactly. I'm excited. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll catch you guys on our next episode. We'll catch you soon. Stay All right. well. All right.
Thank you for listening. Be sure to check back for new episodes of Healthcare Disrupted. Find out more at www.healthcaredisrupted.org. Until next time.